Okay. Yep. Got it. Live streamed. Hello, everybody. It is a <laughs> Monday morning, everybody, on the uh, South Coast, anyway, where we have the SBAU's Astro Hour underway. I'm Baron Ron Heron, proud to be the host of a weekly Zoom podcast. With the South Coast Astronomy and Telescope Society, a club called the SBAU, that's Santa Barbara Astronomical Unit. This, ladies and gentlemen, I proudly announce, is episode 33. If you do your math, 19 more programs on a Monday morning, 11 a.m., live on Zoom from our living rooms or back, I guess our men cave, <laughs> will give us a whole year. And that'll be in the end of, uh, I guess, February in 2022. Anyway, this week... These are the gentlemen, the um, people that run the club. In most cases, we're missing Bruce uh, uh, Murdoch, but we have, of course, our president, Jerry Wilson. Good morning again, sir. Hello. Uh, you're also <laughs> running or not running for president of your homeowners? Oh, no, that election is over. Oh, you I'm did no you longer get... on, on the board at all. Well, please tell me that Cruella DeVille didn't get elected again. Oh, well, I'm not going to make any statements publicly, <laughs> but... Um, <laughs> All if right. you um, if you want to be on the board, you have to campaign, and the oh. other side spent a lot of money campaigning and a lot of time and effort, and we didn't oh. raise a we didn't even send out a mailer. Well, as long as they don't pass the stipulation in your home development that you can't own an electric car, I think you'll be all right. <laughs> no, our things uh, a significant fraction of our community now has uh, electric cars. Well, so does this gentleman, our outreach coordinator, Chuck McBartland. Good on morning. My screen on the left, um, whose wife is also named Pat. She's the merchandise manager. Any outreach happening in October between now and the end? The Just month? a couple of little things that are sort of not public. Um, you know, a couple of hotel events and a winery event and a couple of school events. Okay. Past president and the man who runs the show, our technical wizard, webmaster, and former president, Tom <laughs> Potton is gonna take on the technical elements. And of course, our good friend, Tom Whittemore, former uh, Westmont College science instructor, the bottom. Gonna morning, try to morning, hang a uh, hummingbird feeder in that window behind you. It's, yeah, <laughs> just there. All right. But I guess you might not be able to see it. Here are the uh, headlines. We'll call this uh, what we're gonna talk about or try to get to today, because I gotta tell you, some of us ask the questions and we learn a lot. A lot of you on screen, answer the questions and know a lot, man. I got to tell you, I call it the, uh, what do I call it, Tom? Uh, the brain trust. Borrow that <laughs> from the FDR years. Comets are back. We'll name them. So is Jupiter and its moons. End of the week. You wait till you see our moon in the waxing mode. Also way back, Jupiter and Saturn. And um, <laughs> at the end of the program, unless you want to go into it early, Jerry, um, your forwarded cartoon about the periodic table of elements as it, as it applies to astronomers was kind of fascinating. It's very, very simple. We, we can start with that one if you want. All right, well, let me just tell you, and then we'll interrupt the show or in between other things, some of the cartoons. I got some dandies that you sent us. Uh, here we go, let's see where, uh, oh, astronomers periodic table. Um, do you have that one, Totten? Can you yeah. throw that up? Okay, Get while you're getting that, it's our own uh, Tim Crawford, who said he liked this abbreviated list of elements. He's up in uh, Sacramento, I guess, uh, taking care of a loved one of his family. Maybe he's watching us. Mm -hmm. he's, and not, the list he's not of, up there yet, but he he's, might be, have to go up there this week. All right. Well, our thoughts and prayer go out for his sister. And Tim will miss you on the side. There it is. Periodic table of elements basically... Uh, works out to two main elements, the two first ones, one and two, helium and hyd or hydrogen is the most common, right? Yeah. And mm -hmm. helium are uh, silliness, suck from a balloon and sound like Mickey Mouse when it's number two, but it's very unstable. And then the rest very, are... Very, very, it's very, very stable. stable. Very stable. <laughs> yeah. What's very stable? Helium? Helium. 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 Yeah. Very okay, stable. well, uh, you don't hear much about it. It's not flammable for some reason. It doesn't combine with oxygen. That's because it's very, very stable. Yeah. <laughs> it's inert gas. So hydrogen, as much as we have in the universe, is uh, is it, unstable. It's got to... It burn. likes to combine with things. I wouldn't call it unstable. It yeah. does break down on its own, but it, it's yeah. reactive. 
Okay, you want yeah, to describe it? it? The word you want. That's right. Okay. Well, this is this covers the entire universe in, in abundances yeah. and how astronomers view it. It's kind of a cartoon, but it's kind of not. It's kind of a real description of what astronomers sp speak about. The hydrogen is pretty much the simplest element and is the easiest thing for the Big Bang to have made and did. And then there's a little bit of helium in, in that. And everything else is kind of an impurity in the universe that was made later by stars. They have iron selected out as the star killer because when you fuse elements below iron, you get energy from them and that produces the starlight. And at, at when the internal fusion starts to create iron, you don't get any um, more energy out or any fusion above that. There has to be a big explosion, a source of energy to create elements above iron. And that's why they call it supernova poop. Because <laughs> it's something created from uh, supernova explosions. And then, what, go ahead. What's the number of uh, Fe of iron? I don't recall exactly. 13, 26, something like that. 26. 26, so, okay. But there are common elements above it, are there not? Uh, that a, get created yeah. in the explosion itself, not during the fusion period of a star. Well, all the metals are made during fusion periods. Oh, really? Yeah. So we don't and have the heavier, the ones heavier than iron get made in the in the act, yeah. really super active right. things. Right. And that's a fusion process also. Yeah. But it's it's a single instantaneous fusion process. It's not like a burning over periods of millions of years. Grab that yeah. neutron. Yeah. <laughs> Would it be a fair statement to say that somehow, luckily, our planet got all of them? I'll clear up to the hundred area uranium, the top natural element. I we're guess mostly um, we're mostly made of impur uh, um, impurities, supernova poop. Yeah. Okay. Might it be possible that some planets out there don't have selenium and, and uh, uh, sodium and might have missed out on carbon? Well, if, carbon's if they're solid. Common. If they're solid planets, you know, they likely have those other things in them. Okay. Maybe not in high concentrations. Supernova poop. <laughs> the, yeah, um, this, this, this interpretation was um, drawn by Heidi Westman Neal. And it came through a Facebook page I saw, and I thought it was appropriate, but I want to give her credit. The star killer. Yeah. Who would have thought? So this is the simplified periodic table for why some purposes suppose, in astronomy. Why do you suppose some metals like your iron, your uh, gold, your lead is so heavy and others, aluminum, are not? Because they have more neutrons and protons in them. Yeah, the it's, heavy it's ones just have, a relative thing. Yeah, everything's heavier than hydrogen. <laughs> yeah, but now That's your it. metals, your metals are the only elements uh, other than a compound called water that that can carry electricity. No, no, oh no. What else carry? What's other conductive elements? I my understanding, silicone is used as a uh, That's a right. semiconductor. Right. Silicone is, is is a polymer. You're thinking right. of silicon. Yeah. Silicon. <laughs> Okay, silicon. Yeah, I always mispronounce those things. Silicon Valley, Silicon Valley. Which one is it? <laughs> well, real oh heavy God. up in the supernova poop is uranium, and that will conduct a current. Yeah. Anything <laughs> above, anything above 92. uranium? Did we make anything above uranium? Oh, there's the regular one. Tom. Oh, yeah. Matter of fact, you can see uranium on there somewhere. 92. I'm looking, it keeps moving around. So, okay, there. <laughs> yeah. And everything above there is made. And doesn't last long. The, although, the farther you get to the right, the shorter it lasts. Yeah. And although some of those, there's, there's been some detection of like natural plutonium. It's just very, very rare. Is plutonium above or below uranium? On the numbers? Above. Yeah. Those numbers, basically, for the benefit of anybody that don't know, is the number of protons and electrons, right? That have to match. Protons. Proton, yeah. Well, uh, can you have less or more electrons than the protons? Don't they have to match? No, you, for a neutral atom, you've got to have the same number of electrons as protons. But if the atom is ionized, which many of them are, uh, and many of them lack um, electrons at all, depending on their environment. Right. So it could be a plasma. Okay. And somehow and the neutrons, 
the Go neutrons, ahead. the difference between the atomic number, for example, mendelivium over there at 101, okay. that one is, is atomic number 101, but it's atomic weight 258. So the difference between the two is the neutrons. Right. Oh, well, I thought, okay. Neutrons add into the weight. I thought they were neutral because they're... They're electrically positive. neutral, but they're not neutral mass. Oh, okay. Fascinating stuff. That's great. And okay. Uh, okay, let's go to the main thing. You want to talk comets or you want to talk uh, Jupiter and uh, the moon? Your choice, gentlemen. I kind of like the moon passing by Jupiter and Saturn this week because everybody can enjoy that. You know. Okay. Uh, this weekend, I guess it's going to pass in between them. Um, it's on a waxing mode. It's building steam, getting bigger. And we have a diagram. Yeah, Jerry had a fabulous chart of that. Yeah, I'm assuming the pronunciation, it looks like the name Maria, but it's probably Maria or the yes. Maris, right? Well, we're looking at, yeah, you're, we're not looking at the Maria one. Yeah. We're looking at the um, waxing the in the company of giants. Yeah, there's okay. a really nice uh, figure. Okay, so this is the wrong diagram, right? Here we go. No. No, no, no. no. The, the, star, the, the, the horrible star chart from Astronomy Magazine. Yeah. There we go. Uh, <laughs> what else? Next, next one. Keep one going. more after that. There you go. No. Crab Nebula? October 14, one hour after sunset looking south. <laughs> That's four days from now. Yeah. There, there you go. go. Oh, you passed it. Went past it. Ooh. At least you can call it up fast, Totten. You, you do good. There we go. There you are. There, there you go. Can you enlarge uh, that? Yeah. Can you make it bigger? There, there we go. There we go. All right. Explain that to us. What are we looking at? Which direction? We're That's looking, looking south. The south. South, 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 probably a little. Okay. Mm -hmm. And, and it's it, that this the star that's near Jupiter there, Dana Balgetti, that means the tail of the little goat. Okay. So anytime you see Algeti means kid, little goat. Okay. And Dana's always and Deneb means tail. Mm -hmm. And you can I, see. I, I mean, always think I know it's wrong, but I always think that Dena means swan. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> yeah, wrong association. Yeah, yeah. Is that the only Dena in the sky, Dena no. Baljetti? Oh no, no. there's Deneb tails of all sorts of things. Swan. Yeah. Okay. Uh, in fact, in Cetus, yeah, and Cetus, there is uh, what's that? Uh, Dena Kaitos. Yeah. The tail oh, of the Leo, Leo the lion. Yeah, Denebola. Then up below, little tail. Mm -hmm. Okay, now are we looking at the weekend coming up? No, this is, uh, I think this is um, October 14, which is 12 Thursday. Thursday, Thursday evening. Oh, Thursday. Yeah. Okay. And you can see the, the moon is represented here as just a teensy bit past first quarter. Yeah, yeah. So. And, and, and it's, it's kind of hard. These, these are really bad star charts because of the way <laughs> they depict the stars. But you can Thanks, sort of see Jerry. the teapot in Sagittarius with the big blobs over there. It's yes. a little harder to see in this representation. And then sort of surrounding all of Jupiter and the moon and Saturn is uh, Capricornus, which is the great bikini bottom in the sky. You can see it there. Or a slice <laughs> of watermelon, Chuck. Yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Give me a break. <laughs> Jupiter and Saturn. Are they on the far side of the sun? No, no, they're no, no. On, they're yeah. they're in opposition from us. They oh. they were yeah, so they were close to opposition. So they're right. they're on our side. Yeah, you can see them tonight. For some Your voice dropped out, Tom. I couldn't hear what you said. He said you can see them tonight. Oh, yeah. okay. But, and not this particular configuration with the moon, but yes, yeah, uh, you can yeah. see that smile in the sky or bikini now, bottom. The you know, star you? star you see down there in in the left corner, Fomalo. Um, that's the only star I have confidence in getting the name pronounced right, because I used to listen a lot to the uh, McDonald Observatory little oh. star blurb, blurbs, and they always called uh, this season the Fomalo Hour. About, I see. It's a way south thing, and it just pops above our horizon for a while. Yeah. Yeah. And they always oh, repeat wow. that. So I, I've learned that pronunciation. It's the that's mouth the, of the southern fish. Yeah, that's right. Right. And, and it's of often I, called the, the lonely one because it's the only sort of first magnitude star in that part of the watery sky. Right. Yep. 
Well, is the word fomalo French or German? No, it comes from Arabic. It's it, from might, Arabic. It, it might be Texan. I don't know. <laughs> well, I, I could call it fomal out. <laughs> fomal out. <laughs> yeah. That's, that's why I'm thinking French, because they have the silent word or letters, your X's and IOUs. It's, and, it's, it's a really, really messed up version of, of Arabic. That's because right. Because when these, the Arabs preserved a lot of Greek star knowledge during the Dark Ages. And when those documents were copied back into Latin and Greek, they kept a lot of the Arabic names, mm -hmm. but over, you know, copying by, and then copying again and copying again, it was like playing telephone. The names were kind of <laughs> distorted in many cases. Well, do the size of these dots on the screen represent how bright they are? It looks like a bright they star. They sort of do, yeah. Yes, it is a bright star. Okay. Mm -hmm. you did uh, Messier name stars or any of the no, M's? No, no, no. He was only interested in the money he got from discovering comets. That's <laughs> how he made a living. Well, yeah. comets and uh, star clusters and occasionally whole galaxies. Well, he didn't things realize. that look fuzzy that, that might have been comets. Yeah. He never, never misnamed a star and gave it an M number. Yes, mm -hmm. he did, actually, a double star. Right. Oh, okay. Yeah, okay. First major. So anyway, Deneb al -Gedi, is a multiple star system, oh, 39 light years away in the, in the, in the constellation of the sea goat. Mm -hmm. And the primary star in the system is a white giant. And the combined light of its members make it the brightest star in the constellation. But I believe there's four members. And the two, two brightest one are an eclipsing binary. And the um, different references um, in the, in astronomy magazine, they said that, that the brightest one is also um, at a variable on its own with a period of about one day, and yet and Wikipedia says that the the variability of the primary star of one day has been um, discredited. So I put it down here as uh, controversial. Right, and I'm just going to mention uh, in the upper right part of uh, Capricorn. You see that alpha and then a two, okay? Mm -hmm. Alpha two. Yeah, so uh, that, that star there, the main one there is called Jeti, which is a goat. And then the one underneath it, it says beta, beta. Uh, that is Dahib, D-A-H-I-B. Yeah. Dahib. Okay. And okay. over on the other end of this mm -hmm. um, bikini bottom constellation <laughs> is Delta. And that's the what we're talking about is Deneb al -Gedi. Mm -hmm. And this this is a this is a an animal that is half goat on the right side and half fish on the left side. Right. And this is kind of the boundary between the summertime uh, sky over there with Sagittarius and what's called the watery sky, um, mm -hmm. which um, the constellations kind of after this all have to do with water. You have Pisces, you have Aquarius, you know. Um, and that's because in ancient Sumeria, when they were making up some of these constellations, when the sun was in this part of the ecliptic, that's when they had their rainy season. Yeah. And that works pretty well for, for Santa Barbara, too, because the sun gets over in there around February. Right. Mm -hmm. so yeah, just, that... uh, I was just going to mention that M30 there, it's uh, you know, Messier object number 30, is, is, is a... Um, a real pretty um, globular cluster. And it's always the last thing you try to get before the sun comes up during the Messier Marathon. Okay. Chuck, did you ever get that in the full Messier Marathon, M30? Yep, yep. Okay, good for you. Good. That's a real tough one because the sun just blots out that part of the sky. Well, sometimes, you know, yeah, sometimes the early ones are hard and the, that last one is easier and sometimes it's the other way yeah. around. Yeah. Um, yeah, but Messier Marathon, for people who might not know, is Messier has a catalog of 110 objects and made from France. And just by luck, there's a time of year, usually around uh, March, mm -hmm. end of March, early April, where the sun is over in, in this part of the sky to the left of it, kind of, of on this mm -hmm. diagram. And so you have a chance to go out and in one night see every single Messier object. Right. And so trying to get all 110 of them is called a Messier marathon. Yeah. But M30 is usually tough because the sun is over near that part of the sky. So you got to right. catch it just, just before the sun rises. Yeah. Now, before the common use of go-to telescopes, this used to be quite a star hopping challenge. Yes. yes. But now you can pre-program your mount. 
So if yeah. you can stay up long enough, it becomes easier. Yeah. Well, yeah. <laughs> before, before Tom Totten takes that away, can you tell me if that green triangle we're looking at that you call mm -hmm. bikini bottom, is that an asterism? It's a constellation, no, it's a, but a constellation a, is an asterism. Which is an asterism. Hey, Ron, Ron, do you see the dotted yellow line that encompasses all this? Yes. Yeah, yeah that, that's the border of Capricorn. So that's the constellation border of it. And that's okay. the goat. Yeah. Yeah. The sea, sea, goat. Sea, goat, sea goat, like Chuck said. Well, what is microscopium and aquila? Well, aquila is the eagle. Mm -hmm. Aquarius okay. is the water bearer. Sagittarius on the right. Mm -hmm. And then down below is microscopium. That's the, the microscope. So a lot of these southern constellations were given names in the Industrial Revolution or just before or right around there. So they had scientific names, the microscope, the, uh, the furnace, things like that. And the then pump. PSA is Pisces, Aust Pisces Austrinus. Right. That's a, that's a star. The southern no, no. fish. It's a constellation. It's a constellation. Okay. But uh, in the south, all... there's also a constellation or used to be of a giant boat. And then yes. they later they broke it up into con in to sub components, right? And got a whole bunch of technical con uh, constellations out of it. Yeah, it oh. used to be Ar Argo Navis, yeah. you know, Argo, the uh, what's his face's boat, um, Jason, Ulysses. right? J Jason, thanks, Chuck. Yeah. <laughs> oh, Jason, yeah, yeah. Well, I Jason think we could Argo. we could probably christen that green triangle either the bikini bottom if you want, or we could call it the pandemic mask. Yeah, <laughs> I just I always called it a, a slice of watermelon. So, oh. <laughs> and it's not an asterism. It is. That's it is an asterism. Yes, it's, a constellation is, is also an asterism. Yeah. Yes. Okay, asterisms are a little not a, qualified to be uh, the big no, ones yet. No, uh, Ron. Aster asterism is a generic term. Constellation is a more specific term. Right. But the Big Dipper is not a constellation at all. It's just it is. A, yes. it, it is. is a constellation. Both. No, it's an asterism. No, no, it's an That's asterism. What? And again, you know, you, you could have an asterism made by stars that belong to different constellations, like the famous Summer Triangle, Dana of Altair and Vega. By any okay. chance, is Polaris the North Star inside either an asterism or a constellation anywhere? Or is it just so of... every every star belongs <laughs> to some constellation? Is that and right? Polaris is the end of the handle of the Little Dipper, if you think of that asterism, or it's the end of the tail of Ursa Minor, the Little Bear. Mm -hmm. As thrown onto the, uh, the inside uh, ceiling of the, <laughs> of the planetarium. Yeah. It's called Gladwin. We haven't been in there lately, have we? Any of no. us? Yeah. This is no, no. Not, These constellations stuff. and patterns and asterisms all occur because the human eye tends to process information based on patterns that it sees. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So sure. you, And they came from who? The Moors, the uh, the ancient the Ar Arabs? Well, no. They they preserved Greek star knowledge during the during the dark ages, but most of the constellations date back to like Sumeria and Babylon and and yeah. you know, ancient times. But other cultures throughout across the globe, they have a different history and they have different constellations and different names for these things. Yeah, everybody used the stars the same way. They used the constellations because they often didn't have writing in books. And so this is how they yeah. remembered stories. So they the laid around at night trying to get into their sleeping bags and get to sleep. And they're looking up at the sky every night because they didn't have Wi-Fi. And so um, they just started making patterns up out of the sky. And they tied them to when to plant crops and where to head for their navigation and stuff. So gotcha. they're very useful guides. That's some sort of animal we're looking at there. That's the like, great bear, the, the major. The big bear. bear. That's what I said, there you go, okay. Yep. Thank but you, the Pat. Big Dipper is the rear end of the Big Bear. Yeah, yeah the I rear end you. of the tail. Wow. Well, my grandpa used to look at the belt of Iran and call it the Three Sisters. That was his asterism, I guess. Yep. <laughs> Well, what, Chuck, what do the Aztecs or Mayans think of the, the three the, of the Orion? What do they call it? That was the three hearthstones of creation. That was um, for the Maya. Orion represented a hearth in the, um, you know, in their buildings, their houses. Well, I thought it was like a turtle, too, or something for with you know, carrying stones on its back or something. That was yeah. Orion also 2.0. 
uh, for the benefit of us that don't have technically a a, uh, a telescope, uh, the Messiers are they all fuzzy, or do any of them look like stars? In a, in a small enough scope, they all look fuzzy. There is one called M40 that's just a double star. Mm -hmm. Are any of them part of a constellation? Any of the Messiers, the M's? Clear up well, to they all exist in a constellation, but they're not right. part of the classical representation of a constellation because you need a telescope to see them. Mm -hmm. Or, or they're most, big things like the Pleiades. Yeah, or Orion's Nebula, yeah. which looks like a star to the naked eye. So oh, um, let's go to the moon this week. <laughs> Grand tour. All right. Well, I thought we were doing the moon, but here it is. Well, moon again. This is moon 2.0. Okay. The moon is a half a degree. Is the sun also half a degree? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. That's, that's why we can have eclipses of the sun. Uh, yeah. Okay. So it's passing just off to the spout of Sagittarius, the teapot asterism in the south. Uh-huh. Uh, now can we talk about the Mars, the Maris? The Mari, Mari yeah. The Maria. Um, near side of the moon, which is only the side we get to see, has uh, a list of about 10 there. Yeah. The first one is not called a Mari. It's called an Oceanus. No, it's an ocean. Give us a grand tour of where, where uh, whereabouts did uh, uh, Neil Armstrong and Buzz settle Number down? Number seven. They that's Come down just would... a little bit from the bottom of the seven down and left. You see a, a feature that looks like a little fish with a Pac-Man mouth jumping straight up. And he's okay. grabbing a little white cookie, which you can't really see easily here. And that little white cookie is a crater called um, Moltke. And they landed right near that. Hmm. Otherwise known as the abandoned tranquility base here. Mm -hmm. And you can see evening. seven is Sea of Tranquility. So would it be safe to say that all the other Apollos after that landed in four and two and one and three and all those other? No, we haven't visited all the Mari with yeah. Apollo. Yeah. Just a couple but, of them. And there was one that landed in the highlands. So there's yeah. one that's not in a Mari. We've got some interesting names here. There's Mari Imbrium and Mari mm -hmm. Serenitius, Serenipius. Serenitatus. Uh, I, oh, I can't read my own writing. I'm sorry. <laughs> See, and, Serenity, uh, that's the head of the soccer player. <laughs> one, one of my favorites is number eight there, Mari Crisi in the Sea of Crises, because uh, a very young moon gives you really wonderful detail on that side of the moon there, that right there. Yeah, as Tom is saying, because of moon, lunar libration, Sometimes you can see Marcrisium fairly well, and other times the moon is twisted on its axis and you can't see it very well from Earth. Mm -hmm. So when the moon is very young, a crescent there, you can get that, uh, you can see it real well. And that's the soccer ball for the soccer player. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And it's about 350 miles across. Is that right? Now, the Tycho impact crater at the bottom with... Um, the rays going out from it. When I see that, it always reminds me of an orange. Yeah, <laughs> the whole thing looked like an orange. That Not that it's colored. Egg. It's just because of the rays. Okay, that was a heck of a collision of large I mean, asteroid. That yeah. was a that was a big one, and it hit something white when it hit. Yeah. So. Yeah, and it's a young crater. crater. Jerry, yeah. the, the, the young the younger debris stays white, but as it ages, it, it starts to turn black. Right. So it'll. Yeah. It, under constant proton bombardment, it will eventually lose its whiteness. Yeah. Up at the top, you can see the rim of Mar Imbrium. Uh, that's an impact crater basin, and it's very large, and it has four arrows devoted to the circular rim. That is an impact basin from a single impact. Most wow. of these, I think all of these Maris are impacts. Yeah. Yes. This uh, number, two, number two is one of the last ones because it has a more perfectly circular or um, design or pattern to it that overrides other ones interesting the three names there mean rains moisture and clouds Something they, they thought don't these know. they thought these were all before the telescope they thought these were all water features right mm -hmm. right that, that's why you have mare you know sea yeah huh. that's greek latin. It's italian latin. i think oh it's latin. latin i think it's latin yeah, yeah. oh is Beautiful. it could be latin yeah, yeah. And moisture becomes humorium in that uh, language, which is three. Uh, yeah, moisture humorum, humorum, yeah. 
Well, more of them, okay. New yeah, game. not humor. <laughs> yeah. Well, it, it, humor comes from humors, right? Which was Vapors. these uh, essences that they thought were inside of people that were liquid. Yeah. And that caused disease. <laughs> so um, where, when did Italian or Latin become Italian? Because mare is also a Latin Italian word. Yeah. Well, At what like, point did the transition occur? It was probably gradual yeah. over centuries. Yeah. I mean, right. it, it probably came from the, the more rural areas. You know, the Latin was more the, the city. city language, I think. Okay. Well, I'm wondering and, why they don't call them uh, a single one, marum. Do you know why? Stadium. Well, because mare is, is the singular. Right. M-A-R-E. I know that, but uh, in Latin, as far as I know, unless it's Greek, uh, stadium pluralizes into right. stadia. Curriculum, right. U-M at the end, becomes curricula. Right. Why wouldn't mar- mar- maria be the plural of marum? Unless it's a different uh, language. No, it's not fourth declension. So the other words that you were using, they're fourth declension, and they're usually... Uh, neut- neutered, okay, and so they usually end in U-M or I-U-M, and when it goes to the plural, it goes to an A, okay. Ah, uh, I'm still having I'm trouble. With, I'm There's still five. having trouble with the license plate border that says alumni instead of alum. Yeah, <laughs> you got to be careful with that because for females it'd be alumnae. Alumnae, yeah. alumnae. Yeah, for us it's. Oh alumnae. God, we're in the age of pronouns, aren't we? Yeah. <laughs> But a lot of them are going away. They don't say octopi anymore. It's octopuses. I'm yeah, sorry. I saw that. Yeah. And hippopotami used to be plural for the big uh, river horse. But yeah. that's what the translation is. Yeah. A, a fair you amount of the... language has, has changed from, from ancient history when I was taking English. You know, you got people spelling all right as one word with one L and, and uh-huh. other things that are sort of acceptable now, but would have been downgraded on any paper I wrote in in elementary school. Do you know the, in that vein of octopi and stuff, do you know the plural of sphinx? Not sphinxes? No, it's sphingi. Oh my God. At least it used to be in, when I was in elementary school. I see. How about locus, L-O-C-U-S? Loci. Yeah. Yeah. Did I mispronounce that? Is Is it losus? No, no, low side. Locus. No S. Low, low side. Okay. Uh, if you do classical Latin, it's loci. So I, when I studied Latin, you know, four years, we, we had basically the way we pronounced it in church. Okay. It's called church Latin. And so we would say loci. Like, like you'd be Italian, like an Italian would say it. Okay. I'll bet you those kids out there using the word like every 12 words don't have a clue about any of this. Probably not. <laughs> that that's old valley speak that's probably ancient history to the kids now <laughs> oh i understand that but it just drives me nuts i'm the only okay. person left fascinating so you're going to be watching the waxing moon at the end of the week uh, yeah if the the uh, feature here that's pointed out is that you can look at the at the just before and as the moon becomes its first quarter you can find uh mar frigoris and mm-hmm. uh the, uh, the these are pointed out at this time because that's where the terminator is. And when you get the terminator mm-hmm. in a certain feature, then you see all the shadows and you can see visualize it in 3D and you can see all the um, structure. So um, yeah. that's what's being called at this time. Yes, yeah, it's, it's, gor- it's a, just a gorgeous photo and you can see the light is coming off on the right. Okay. And just gently lighting up uh, the left sides of many of these big, big, big craters. Very pretty. And yeah. that's a, a very spectacular formation. Is up near the top there, Valles Alpes, mm-hmm. the Alpine Valley. So mm-hmm. that's where that Mari Imbrium hit, and some big piece of debris basically scoured across through there yeah. and cut this valley through through the rim. It skipped across the surface. Yeah. And I've always liked Aristoteles and Eudoxus. Those are prominent ones when I first started taking pictures of the moon back in uh, high school. Um, <laughs> I would always seem to get that early in the evening with crescent moons. But every one of those names we're seeing is an impact crater. Nothing, a mountain doesn't get named, or is that your Alpes? No, some Montes. mountains are named too. Yeah, it's called Montes. Yeah. Well, there's a, there's a name on the left that looks very familiar from Saturn, from our orbiting... Oh, Cassini? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that guy did a lot of stuff and he got 
<laughs> a lot of stuff named after him, including a, a spacecraft. I don't think w- when you're talking about impact craters, it used to be debated when I was a kid in the 50s, whether these were all impacts or um, volcanic, volcanic activities. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I don't think there's any that are, I would point out that are volcanic. Yeah, I think there are some yeah. small ones, but nothing big. Yeah. And, and Ron, you can see right right in the middle, there's Montes Caucasus, the Caucasus Mountains. They named, right. um, they named some of these rim features on the moon after mountain ranges on the earth. Mm-hmm. You suppose there's a way someday that we could land in one of those mountainous areas or they just don't want to take the chance? Oh, I think yeah. eventually we'll be able to land anywhere you want to go on that. Yeah. You know, just, or, just depends or, on whether Elon builds a hub there or not. Yeah, yeah. yeah it, you'd be able to get there. I doubt you'd want to land on some of these. I mean, you don't even want a helicopter to land on some mm-hmm. of our mountain features. Yeah, I'm kind of curious what, what inspired the, that one name there. It's, it's kind of in the middle to the right. Lacus Mortis, the lake of death. <laughs> oh, oh Lacus yeah. Mortis, yeah. Yeah, Lacus Mortis, the lake of death. Well, is there and a map? Is there a mantle in the moon? You say it, it used to be volcanic. You suppose it still has uh, liquid lava inside? Well, the, the Mare surface is frozen lava lakes. Right. But that wasn't created by a single eruption from inside. These were created by an impact where the impactor and the moon actually liquefied or it broke through a crust into a magma pool. Mm-hmm. And right. there is a mantle down there, but but it's not as, as liquid and as motile as, as ours is. But there mm-hmm. does seem to be a small liquid core still left. Yeah. There's no plate tectonics. Nothing's right. sliding around on the moon. Although there's sort of a form of tectonics in that the moon, as it cooled off, shrank. And you get these um, faults, fault lines, where, mm-hmm. where um, bits of the crust cracked and then subsided. Yeah, compression ridges. Yeah. Yeah, there's a real famous one we show to people at uh, outreach uh, called, well, it's Rupa's Recta, but it means uh, the straight wall. Oh, yeah. They're very, 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 very pretty. Yeah, we beautiful. thought that was, I always pictured that as a cliff, but it yeah. turns out it's only a, like a 30 degree slope or 25 degree right. slope. It's not really yeah. that steep. It just shows a good shadow at certain right. times. It, it, sometimes what you can see is there's a small crater named Bird. Uh, on the end of that that sh- that line like shadow, and it looks like a saber. A lot yeah. of times, you know, I know Chuck will call it a saber. I will call it a saber during a uh, an outreach. Mm-hmm. Hmm. Well, it's we not- all know the other side of the moon where China is pre- pretty much establishing a foot toehold. There's not a lot of Maris, are there? It's all right. oh, just one small one, so oh, it's healthy or something. Okay. Just a large crater. Mare Moscovensis, like the Moscow Sea. There's a small one there. Yeah. Mm. Um, but, but there's few pictures of that other side. Oh, I, no, there's plenty. Yeah. Mm-hmm. All yeah, I we, ever see is what we're looking at now. <laughs> no, but well, the, um, there, our, our U.S. Right. Geological Survey has completely mapped the moon. Very um, nice pictures showing altitudes and possible chemical compositions. It's mapped in detail all around. I, so think, Jerry, you, I think there's even a, a um, version of Google Moon you can get, yes. like Google Earth. If, yeah. if you're on Google Earth, you can go to both Google Moon and Google Mars. Okay. Yeah. And Google Sky. Wow. Jerry, I don't want to spoil your orange, but I see a cantaloupe. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> and I love cantaloupe. It makes me oh, hungry. Oh, yeah. The cantaloupe will do too, yeah. <laughs> okay. Have we ever landed in a crater? Has any space agency landed in a crater? Yeah, Jezero crater, where we have the rover now on Mars. Mm-hmm. On Mars, they plus well, the, plus some of the surveyors uh, or and rangers early in the moon uh, exploration landed in craters. Yeah, and well, here you can I, see the Chinese the Chinese spacecraft landed in von Karman crater. Mm-hmm. Okay, are we looking at the far side of the moon or yes. are we looking at Mars? Oh, yeah, boy, are you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, okay. you can see very few Mares. Right. There, and there's a Mare Moscoviensis, is that big dark spot there in the upper left. Oh, okay, okay. I bet you the Chinese call it something else. They don't use Mares, I bet. They use Chinese oh, words. They, they use, they use this, this is the standard nomenclature for the moon. Yeah. Is it really? Mares, okay. 
fascinating. Oh, everybody hard. has a piece of the action, and as they discover more stuff, they get more more things named after the discoverer. Yeah. So you, there's a lot of Russian stuff on the backside, and soon there'll be more fine detail in Chinese. Well, I look at it and I wonder where in the, where in the world is the the monolith buried? So that, <laughs> no, that was in um, Clavius. Was Thanks in not. Clavius. Oh, is that a is that a uh, that's a full crater, isn't it? Somewhere that's a big crater. Oh, it's a beauty. It's a favorite at star parties. Yeah, yeah. for me. Yeah, I love that one. Arthur C. <laughs> Clarke decided to pick that one for. I guess it has a little semicircle of increasing size mm -hmm. craterlets inside of it that make it its spotting feature. God, this is fascinating. Those are not Clavius. Gary, just to go back to your, um, I, I have a Latin dictionary here. Everybody should have one. Okay. <laughs> and I just looked up the word for C. Okay. It's neuter. And it's mare, M A R E. Okay. Okay. I have my mother's Greek dictionary. Okay. okay. Mm. So, um, but I'm not going to go through it. <laughs> but a bunch of Maris is a Maria or a Mario. Oh, yeah. Mario. Okay. Interesting. Is that That's... your big fat Greek dictionary? <laughs> Actually, it's a real little thin one. Oh, okay. <laughs> My mother was a language major at the University of Iowa and she, she could speak it, or could, knew ancient Greek. That's neat. That's really neat. She Did was they also speak? very religious and she read <laughs> the Bible in Greek. At my, at my high school, we had a year of Greek at Latin school. Is there a difference between ancient Greek and what they speak in Athens today? You suppose? Apparently. Oh, sure. Oh, yeah. They oh, yeah. wouldn't be able to understand each other. Okay. I don't know. I've never heard anyone. Uh, I don't know about that, Ron. Yeah. My well, mother made a distinction between the two. Mm -hmm. Where did they speak Latin fully? The, during the Roman Empire? Yeah. Was Rome? Well, that was all Latin. Uh, Latin. Actually, it became in favor throughout Europe for educated people and scientists. Latin. And at one point, all, all major scientific works were written in Latin. Yeah. Like, like all of Newton's works. Right. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Principia, right? Yeah. Principia Mathematica. So, yeah. And probably through centuries of Catholicism, that's all the people in the church heard was Latin. Probably didn't understand right. a bit. Well, yeah. A lot of the languages like Spanish and Portuguese, mm -hmm. um, you know, they, they derived from Latin yeah, after right. the empire collapsed. So, mm -hmm. or they were the local, you know, vulgar Latin that, that changed. Right. Mm -hmm. I've always been fascinated by that. Somebody, a Latin person, I guess, originally handed them out to the different European countries. Here, France, I got a lot of vowels for you guys. Make yeah. sure some of them you can't hear. Germany? And poor Czechoslovakia only got the consonants. That's right. Yeah, that, that's that's Finnish too. Yeah, it's also Polish. Finnish doesn't use vowels. Finnish Finnish is a weird language, and it's related yeah. to Hungarian and Basque. Of that's all right. Things. That's right. Do you know how to pr pronounce the little O with a cross across it? What does that pronounce as? Same as I know word? that. Like I know Nistrum. Or a little uh, point on the uh, above it. Yeah. Fascinating stuff. I know so, the two dots <laughs> above it. And, you know, go, going to a Latin school inspired a lot of crazy puns and things like that. So I'll just give you one just for the heck of it. Okay. Uh -oh. Brace yourself. So, so, ready? Yep. Decem est clamor. And his orchestra. Something yeah. is noise. Good job. Good job, Chuck. Really? Ten, decem ten est is clamor racket. Tennis racket. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Let's wow. just go up and look at M1. All right. Which uh, is cleverly titled Comet 67P Churumayoff Garrison. <laughs> okay, gotcha. All right. Comets are us. Yeah. Three of them out there, but they're not going to get here for any. There, time. But in the sky with them is M1, the first, uh, the first Messier object. And it was discovered or drawn first by the third Earl of Ross in 1844. And you see his hand sketch there uh, made at the telescope. What do you remember what size telescope he had? Was that a 78 inch or something? 60 inch. 60 inch, okay. And With then- With two, two big speculum uh, mirrors and they tarnished quickly. So he had two yeah. of them and you'd roll one out and polish it while you rolled the polished one back in. 
and have he changed the figure on it every time he polished too. Yeah. <coughs> All right, well, catch me up. But well, that's not what we're watching here. This is the Crab Nebula, right? Or is this what he saw? Yeah, but that's what he looked at with that telescope. Oh. That, on we... the left, that's his drawing through his 60-inch spectrum telescope. Oh. Nowadays, we make tel- beard mirrors out of glass, and we coat them with the shiny surface. Here, here it was made out of the shiny metal. They didn't know how to coat things well like that. Wow. So, and first they started coating them with silver, which works great, but it tarnishes too. And it's, it's a dangerous chemical and some people would blow themselves up with it. So, and then on the right is the Hubble Space Telescope view of M1. And if you kind of look at the right ribs in the picture on the right, you can kind of pick out the pattern of what he was seeing, but I have to squint a lot to get the two together. So, okay, well, he, he was also he, the first to see spiral structure in galaxies in the, in the Whirlpool yes. galaxy. Mm-hmm. So the rubber duck yeah, shape seven p is in the vicinity of this incredible nebula. Yes. It's up there yes. now. And, and you can tell the difference. If you, go to, the, if you go to the star chart, uh, it shows R and... Somewhere, this is another one from the Scott t- from the magazine. Sorry about these star charts, but I was pressed for time over the weekend, so I didn't <laughs> have time to make my usual chart from the X. I just clipped them out of the magazines. But you can see M1 in the little square down between October 10 on the top yellow line. Oh, yeah, and Jerry. That's why we had a, a you're dropping out jerry yeah oh am i yeah okay Every now and then. go ahead no. will someone else explain it then <clears throat> october 5 and october 10 in the top yellow line just below the line you can see m1 in a square that that's the sign i guess for the symbol for a supernova remnant and it's labeled m1 messy a1 hmm? yeah and we call it a nebula, the crab. It's a planetary nebula. No, well, no, but it's, it's not, planetary. not it's the same. Remnant. It's right, but it's about the size and shape of a planetary nebula, yeah. which have no planets. So it has nothing to do no. with planets. No, mm-hmm. but it has a different source than the planetary nebula. But is this is the Churyumov um, Jerem Semenko? Is that the big one, the huge one that they've never had a comet that size before that we were no, talking? No, no, no. Which one is that? That's uh, 21 NUC or something like that. That's the Robinsonette. That one's different. That one's not visible easily in a small telescope yet. So yeah, this is the rubber ducky one we covered about two weeks ago, three weeks ago. Rubber ducky, you're the one. Okay, well, there's two others mentioned in your Uh notes, Jerry. 4P Fay, 4P slash Fay, F-A-Y-E, south. And the mm-hmm. C twenty nineteen L three comet. We don't have common names for yeah, that. Yeah, that's not displayed on the. That's not displayed on the Finder chart. Okay, but just the first two. All right, it's in, they're in Taurus, and are all of these comets heading this way, or at least getting closer, or are they any of them heading out? They're, Trimov, I think, is heading out. Yeah, they're just they're just up in our sky around at a convenient time. They're well, not they naked eye brightness. Okay. Comets don't necessarily go way in like the interior of Mercury, do they? They sometimes skirt Jupiter or get as far in as Mars and then go head back out. Yes. Big wide. But they're still a comet. They'll still yeah. have a tail. They look fuzzy. They have, a, as they used to call it, a bearded star. Mm-hmm. And what's that big one again that's hundreds of miles across? It's much bigger than most comets. That's got, it's got two persons' names. One of them is like Robinsonette or Robinette. It, it's, I think it's 2014 or 2017, NU, uh, 21 NUC. So at any, one t- at any one time in history when we have these telescopes, is there many comets out there? Yeah, you- right yeah. now there's many, many comets. Mm-hmm. And that's rare. That we have no, 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 that's not rare. All right, like what Haley big dramatic, big dramatic comets that you can see with your naked eye. That's rare. Yes, okay. yes. But now the Crab Nebula has nothing to do with the Crab uh, uh, 
piece of the zodiac. No, no, that's oh, no, 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 that's cancer, the crab. <laughs> okay, just a lot of crab. This is, this is in the bowl. Mm -hmm. uh, well, the, uh, oh. but it is a messier, right? That's M1. Yep. 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 Mm -hmm. It's the first one he logged. That's the one. That's he was, he was actually following a comet going through that part of the sky, very similar, I guess, to the path of Churyuma of Gerasimenko here. And he came across M1. Okay. But now magnitude 8.4 means that you can't see it with the naked eye, right? Or Right. Yeah, that'd be tough. <laughs> if it's a messy object in general, you can't see it naked eye, except for some of the big star clusters. Yeah, like Andromeda, you know. Yeah, or, yeah. Well, technically, according to your notes, uh, the supernova remains uh, directly between the comet and third magnitude Alheka. God, I hope I said that right. Which is <laughs> Zeta, uh, Zeta Tauri, which marks one of the bull's horns. And 67P, which is the one we're talking about, is uh, fuzzy. And it's magnitude 10. It's even thinner. Yeah, so... These are people with machines to watch them. Yeah. And that well, magnitude if, 10 is an integrated magnitude over the whole extent of the coma. So it's actually going to appear very dim. Yeah. About what number of magnitude do we see it with a naked eye? Six. Six. six, 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 seven, yeah. seven, seven. six well, seven, that's seven. that's very rare. But even six is a challenge from my backyard. Yeah. And, and do those magnitude numbers go minus when they're really bright? Yep. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. The, the, the sun, sun is, is what, minus 26 or something? Mm -hmm. A full moon is minus 13. I wonder who came up with that system. That's, uh, that, that's another one of these uh, antiquity things where there was a catalog that Ptolemy or somebody made or, or and, and they, um, they said, these are stars of the first magnitude for really bright stars. And then slightly dimmer stars were stars of the second magnitude. <laughs> and, and so it just, it just uh, from that, once we got photometry, we, we made the, the magnitude scale. So right. it's, it's an anachronism. Each magnitude right. is two and a half times the ne next neighboring magnitude. Right. So right. magnitude five is two and a half times brighter than magnitude six. Right. And if you go through five magnitudes, that's a factor of 100 in brightness. So it's a logarithmic scale. Yeah. Yep. Mm -hmm. but and now, it mirrors kind of the way your eye reacts to light. Right. Because mm -hmm. it mm -hmm. started out as visual impression. Yes. Mm -hmm. Old man Messier, did he use it? Did he see some sure. things with his naked eye and then catch up with his M's using a telescope, you suppose? Stuff he couldn't see? No. M1, he started off think. with telescopic stuff. He started adding the naked eye visible stuff when he saw how much recognition that um, Herschel was getting in England for his catalog. So he started yeah. to add his catalog with things like the Pleiades, hoping to get elected to the French Academy of Sciences. And it worked. See, free enterprise and competition rears its head in astronomy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, some of those were named by other people, not even by him, but they have BM on it. They're called Messiers. Well, because he cataloged them also. He, he might not yeah. have known of some other dis earlier discoveries. Yeah. And surprisingly, um, he, he basically overlooked things like the double cluster of Perseus. You know, I mean, that's, that's naked eye big time. So. Well, you had some great pictures up there, Tom Totten. Uh, I think we saw the double, the rubber ducky. We did yes. last week, I think, or the week before. But Well, Tom just had a whole bunch of them up. A second ago. Oh. Fascinating stuff. Uh, can I throw in something I just learned? And I'd like to know if you know about it. Mm -hmm. I think it's called the DART Project. It's from yes. NASA. Guess what they're going to launch and what they're going to do with it in about 11 months. They're going to go smack into an asteroid and see if they can change its path. Oh, that's right. Yeah. Whoa. And I hope they uh, get it right. Yeah. <laughs> do they have the asteroid picked? Yes, uh huh. It's actually a, a, a double asteroid, and they're going to smack into its moon and see if they can change its orbit. I think wow. that's one of the things they're going to hit. Now these aren't heading this way; they're not going to hit us anyway. But right, you know that thing should be depending on the composition of what they're doing. That should be easy to figure out mathematically what's going to happen. But I'm they don't know the composition for sure. Yeah. yeah. So I guess this is a test of that. Yeah. Anybody and know? there was just a study where they, they looked at the old, you know, detonate a nuke next to it 
And the fear before was, you know, you create a shotgun blast and it's worse. Yeah. But if you use a big enough nuke, apparently you can spread the shotgun blast out enough so that it does mitigate the impact danger. Mm -hmm. You have a million. How far, how far from Earth at that point when they set it up? Yeah, you want to set it off far away. Yeah, and then you get a, a rain of radioactive meteors. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, so that would add an extra brightness component to the meteor shower. <laughs> What I learned in the news is that this asteroid is about the size of Las Vegas's Ferris wheel. And what they're going to crash into it is dinky. But they think it might just nudge it a little, right? Yeah, give it a measurable change. We've landed on some asteroids, but this is a little... And we've even crashed on some comets, too, haven't we? Or asteroids just crash them yeah. for whatever reason. Yeah. Sure, if that'll keep us we've safe. We've got samples of some comets or I guess some asteroids and comets too. Well, this may be uh, considering they're going to launch next month, uh, a future talking point from you, Mr. President. Mm -hmm. In the meantime, we did not get the uh, cartoon saved, but I can tell you a couple of good ones that mm -hmm. you might look up and maybe we'll get them on spau.org that President Jerry forwarded to us. Helium was the onboard dreaded Death Star deep in space, Lord Darth Vader. Uh, has his oversized black Nazi war helmet off, and he's uh, standing at the counter there inhaling oxygen from the tank, while hidden beneath the counter are a couple of uh, giggling stormtroopers. Those are the guys yeah. in the white, and they're inhaling helium. The storm, yeah, the stormtroopers have relabeled Darth Vader's oxygen bottle, or no, the, they've relabeled helium bottles as oxygen bottles, Oh. And so Darth Vader is inhaling the helium and it's making his voice funny and they're cracking up over it. <laughs> Instead of having this deep demanding voice, it's got this little Mickey Mouse voice. There it is. <laughs> he found it. Thank you, Tom. Oh, I missed that part of it, but it was still funny. Yeah. And so what they did, oh, they're giggling because they're giving it to Darth. Lord, yeah, they giving him a Donald Duck voice. <laughs> Okay, we got that one now. Way up is a great one. Uh, if you can find it, Tom Totten, uh, maybe we can close out with this uh, because this cracked me up when I saw it and you set it out. A couple in the elevator have uh, gone apparently to the penthouse and the door opens <laughs> and they're staring out into the dark, star studded, cold cosmos. And he says, You just had to press that top button, didn't you? Damn it. <laughs> This reminds me of uh, Twilight Zone in a way. I've seen <laughs> scenes like this in movies. I don't know where you find them, Mr. Prez, but keep sending them. We'll make them part of the show. Okay. You have any idea what, what we may be talking about next week? Can you promote, pre-promote? I, I have been thinking about if the rest of the group agrees uh, of doing a, a, a three-segment thing over three different weeks about how um, cameras work. Uh, to take astronomical pictures, uh, how the light right. is detected and how the camera is constructed and then how to use it to take pictures uh, for popular thing through cell phones and stuff. Oh, so really? We'll a guide to that. So that'll, that'll probably take about 15 or 20 minutes of each of those shows. And uh, one of our SBAU members, I'm not sure if I've met him, Jim Williams, uh, I hope you got his UC2 mount in case anybody's listening that has that happened to have one. For his H Alpha telescope, he sent out a, a notice. I thought I'd give him a oh, shot there just in case. Ron, he... Ron, the UC2 mount is that special mount that we made for handicapped people so that wheelchairs can get under it. So when he's talking about the UC2 mount, he's, he, he, he's thinking of getting a Celestron C8 mount, just the fork arms, and putting this solar telescope on it and sticking that on the UC2 mount so that, yeah. so that handicapped people can look during star yeah. parties. He's the a designer and chief engineer of the U, uh, UC2 telescope to project. Yeah. Is he in a wheelchair? Have I met him? No. Was, no. no. Oh, he's not. He's just compassionate. Yeah. And okay. and actually, he could, is the 60 millimeter small enough that he could mount a piggyback on the C8? It might be too big for that. I don't well, know. He, whatever he needs or wants, you think Art Harris has it somewhere actually i got an explanation for that it's that he's going to 
it's just going to take off the next star eight inch scope and put on the solar scope on the same uh, hydraulic jack. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. The, yeah. Of, and of he wants to put it on a, on a C8 fork mount and he got one from Bruce. Apparently Bruce said he had one. Ah, yeah. There you see. Okay. There's the UC2 mount with the C8 on it. And Jim. And Jim. And Jim. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's Jim. Okay. So I this know, is yeah. a this is a wheelchair accessible outreach telescope that the SBAU uh, helped sponsored, and Jim put it together and designed it. Well, somebody better call him or tell him on an email. We talked about him. I, I, he might be watching. He yeah. might yeah. be. Well, you can watch us on uh, what the archives sbau.org or, or yeah. YouTube. Just uh, yeah. SBAU yeah, right. Hour. You go to our website, sbau.org, and then uh, click on a picture there, and it'll take you to the YouTube site where all our videos are stored. You, you can't do it on YouTube itself? Just enter on YouTube? Oh, sure, yeah. You could you could search for SBAU on YouTube and you know, astronomy and Santa Barbara, and that might bring us up that way. Well, all right, gentlemen. You fascinated both of us, all of us. Again, thank you very much. And that was episode 33. We got 19 to go to wrap up our first year. and. I don't know how many more months we got of this dumb pandemic waiting for the next uh, variant to arrive after Delta. We'll probably go through the whole Greek alphabet. Right? What was that other one with a short name? Um or Lum or Bug? <laughs> Lambda? Iota? Lum? Oh, Delta. There was another one. That was a short one syllable. Gamma, there's Lambda, Gamma, Iota. <laughs> yeah. Eta. We'll, have, we'll have them all. It'll keep going. Let's do it again. Let's assemble and uh, break bread together. Actually, it's Tom Whittemore's bread, but uh, oh, yeah. we get a nice loaf of sourdough. Thanks, everybody. We'll see you next week for the Thanks, SBAU Tom. hour. Tom. Thanks, Ron. And Adios, everybody, Ron. Guys, Bye, guys. Bye. Click off now.